Ok. 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 Okay. Um, as I 
Thank you for the invitation here today and to this beautiful space. Um, of course, France led an association with it here, where it came in 1914 when he enlisted in the British Army. Um, Michael has asked me to say a little bit about the museum, the Francis Ledwich Museum in Spain. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can. No, no raise can't. your voice. No, it, it may be, yeah, not that great. Raise your voice. Okay, that shows. <laughs> Michael has asked me to say a little bit about the Francis Ledwich Museum in Slane, which I've left out some flyers on it. It's the uh, cottage birthplace of Francis Ledwich, and this is where he was born in, in 1887. Um, his family lived there, um, his nephew lived there until the late 70s, and then in 1979, uh, 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 an advertisement uh, appeared in the Irish Times saying Poets Cottage for Sale. So the local community council, uh, my mother, Pearl Baxter and Peter Baxter were very involved in it at the time and they said, well look, we have to buy this cottage, we can't let it go. This is the birthplace of uh, Slane's famous son, Francis Ledwich, and it must be preserved. So they um, looked for funding, the, there was no leader or anything in those days, so they just really looked to the public for funding and it came back five pounds, one pound, ten shillings, everybody contributed. They also got a grant from the Ireland Fund and um, Anko, which is today's solace, they restored it. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. 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 They helped to um, restore it, so it's, it's restored back to its original, you know. There was a lot of features there anyway, there happened to be anything drastic done to it, um, except, you know, um, putting in lighting and things like that. So it's, um, it's open every day, uh, seven days a week, um, and it only closes for a short period from December to the end of January. So if you're ever down that way, uh, pay a visit. Um, it's, it's a, it is a lovely place, a beautiful garden, very tranquil, and it's looking particularly beautiful at the moment because all the bluebells are in blossom, and it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions on it, feel free to ask me about it. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Francis Ledwich. Um, as I said, I'm not an expert. I um, have been involved with the cottage since 1990. My parents, as I said, were there before me. And I uh, have had various roles. And yes, was very involved in the 19, uh, 2017 centenary um, celebrations, um, which were fantastic. And we'll show you some pictures at the end of those. And we'll talk a little bit about them then as well. So, on hearing of the death of Francis Ledwich, the poet John Drinkwater said, His poetry exalts me, whilst not his death. To those who know what poetry is, the untimely death of a man like Ledwich is nothing but a calamity. Francis Ledwich was the second youngest son of Patrick and Anne Ledwich, and was born on the 19th of August, 1887, in the farm neighbour's cottage at Janeville Slane. His father died suddenly when he was just four years old and that dashed Anne's hope of the dream of a well-educated family. At the age of seven, he wrote his first poem in Slane School to gain a half day on Scrove Tuesday because the master seemed to have forgotten about it. So when he got the master out of the room, he got the slate and he wrote. Our master is too old for sweet, too old for children's play, like Aesop's dog, but he can't eat, no other people may. <laughs> so needless to say, they got their half day. <laughs> um, he, he left school at 14, uh, he said he had learned all he needed at that time, and he went to work on local farms. He was a good, hefty, strong young chap and he worked on the local farms. And then his mother heard there was a job going in the kitchens in Slane Castle. We have a photograph of him there, on the left, at the back. And uh, she 
spoke to the cook and she got him a job there. And he was, uh, he worked in, uh, he was a kitchen boy. And uh, every morning the cook went to see Lady Cunningham with her slate to get the menu for the day. And on her return to the kitchen, she would pop the slate on the shelf and consult it from time to time. And the slate fascinated Francis. And uh, each morning he'd study it fastidiously, learning off all the names of these exotic dishes. And he was only there a short time when one morning he decided he would rub out the day's order and substitute it with a rougher bill of fare. And he put down pig's feet, spuds and cabbage. <laughs> but the cook wasn't impressed. And so he lost his job. So he went back to farm work then. Uh, his, other, his other brother Michael was working in uh, the grocers of uh, Daly's in that farm at the time and he was moving on so his fr uh, Frank's mother asked Mr Daly to take on Frank. He started there but he was extremely homesick. He said, I could not bear brick horizons. All my dreams were calling me home. One night he sat up in bed and he wrote his first poem of note behind the closed eye. He was 16 years old. When he written the last line, he jumped out of bed and he walked the 30 miles home to Slane. He was determined that he would never leave home again and he took up any old job at local farms and he was very happy. And he studied shorthand and typing at night and read books and logic and astronomy. And he studied the English poets from Chaucer to Swinburne, trying especially to the Elizabethan and the ballads that came before the Great Renaissance. So he was working uh, by day and studying by night, and in between, between times he was writing poetry. And his poems were being published in the local paper, The Girl Independent. And he was gaining a certain notoriety. And by 1912, he had amassed quite a copybook of poems. And he sent them off to Lord Dunsany, this that's Dunsany Castle there, and we have the side of Lord Dunsany as well. And Dunsany was a well known mead writer and, and playwright. And um, on reading the poems, Dunsany was astonished at the brilliance of the eye of this young poet and his descriptions of nature. Language captured the look and distinctive atmosphere of the mead landscape. He describes the great sea of grass rippling into purple gradients of the wind and clover. As Gonzani said, he took us by surprise with familiar things. The pale rose, the hills blue in the distance, and the simple fields. Yellow and brown alternate on the height, hanging in silence there like battered sheaves. Dunsany wrote to Frank and he invited him to Dunsany Castle and he gave him the full use of his library. And he also introduced him to the Dublin Literary Circle, which brought him into the company of Catherine Tiny, Patrick Conn, George Russell, and he had all already met Oliver St. John Bogarty and Thomas McDonough in Dunsany Castle. I see you have some lovely pictures of them here. Well done, Michael, on that. <coughs> McGlynn and Ledwich became firm friends and Dunsany taught Ledwich all he knew about technique. <clears throat> he selected the best poems for publication and submitted them with a letter of introduction to the periodicals that were mostly, most likely to accept them. He also began to put together 50 poems for his first book, Songs of the Fields, which was later published by Herbert Jenkins in London and received rave reviews in the British press. Frank was politically active. In 1911, he was working in the copper mines in Beaupark. And when the working conditions there were quite intolerable, there was flooding and loss of life, he called a strike. But none of his fellow workers supported him. So he was out of the job again. He was also a founder member of the Mead Labour Union in 1906. That was the second branch to be set up in the country. And he worked for a year as a full-time official in the union. Like Thomas McDonough, he was a Gaelic revival enthusiast. 
He had attempted to have Irish classes become enslaved, but met with seeming indifference and even coolness from the Gaelic League in need. Around this time, Francis fell in love with Ellie Bobby. Ellie's family farmed in the hill of Slane, and she lived there with her three brothers and cousin, Tessie Wall. Frank was friendly with the family and visited every week. It was a household of young people because the father had died when the children were young and the mother died in 1908. <coughs> Ellie was apprenticed as a milliner to Clark's Grapery Shop, Shop in Shop Street, Drogheda. And when Ledwidge began to bring his book have his poems uh, published in the Drop Independent from 1910 onwards, he would give them to Ellie on a Sunday night and she would bring them into the Drop Independent on Monday morning. He was besotted with Ellie and he wrote over 30 poems for her. After some time ago, she brought, broke off the relationship and she married a man, a local man called John O'Neill, and they went to live in Manchester. And sadly, Ellie died on the birth of their child, the first child, in June 1915. And uh, Ledwidge was heartbroken. He always thought he would win her back. Then in the spring of 1914, Frank and his younger brother Joe were founder members of the Volunteers in Slain. Frank was elected secretary, responsible for correspondence and organisation. As the executive in Dublin had no funds during the first month, subscriptions were canvassed from Irish exiles in England and America, and most of the members in the early days had to pay for a drill instructor, travel and other expenses out of their own pockets. As Frank and Joe had a brother and sister living in Manchester, Frank offered to make the trip over there to further the cause and his only experience up to that of public speaking was reading his poems in the Dublin Literary Society. But now he was going to give a talk in Manchester for the purpose of founding a branch of the volunteers there. All his free time was taken up with the volunteers then, and the Slurian Corps drilled two evenings a week and devoted their Sundays to training, making lengthy group marches and meetings up with other volunteer units. Uh, 15th of August is a big day in Slane. August was a big day, it was the Passion Day or Lady Day. And on Sunday the 15th of August, um, about a thousand uh, pilgrims would normally converge on the Holy Well with bottles and cans for the water. But on, on the 15th of August 1914, they were pushed aside as of more, over 5,000 people filled the village. Approximately half that number were volunteers, many of them with full equipment. There were a few on the hill of Slane, where there was a big grandstand with flags and bunting, and numerous corps of volunteers, including Slane, with language among them, were accompanied by pipe bands. Many dignitaries were present, including the Marcus of Cunningham, Lord Fingal, and Insane. Frank was also elected to the Navan Rural District Council and Board of Guardians, and the first meeting at which minutes record his presence is the 1st of July 1914. A resolution was read from the Eaton Dairy Urban Council protesting against the proposed arms proclamation, which was a legal measure aimed against volunteers. Ledwidge spoke in favour of the protest, saying public opinion is the only weapon we now have and we must yield it unmercifully. Following the split in the volunteers after John Redmond's speech at Woodenbridge in September 1914, meetings were held all over the country to discuss the division. At such a meeting in Slane, the whole hall declared for Redmond, but only six men opposed the resolution, and these included the two Ledwidge. Frank and Joe. When Frank walked out of the hall that night, the volunteers to whom he had given his heart, time and all his spare cash for the past nine months had ceased to exist. At a meeting of the Navan Rural Council on the 10th of October 1914, 
that which would not be associated with a motion congratulating at Redmond. He announced at the meeting to the laughter of those present, so far as real home rule was concerned, they were as far off it today as ever. Nine days later, at a meeting of the Land Board of Garden, he was the only member to hold out against the agreement to rescind its advertising contracts with the volunteer, the organ of the pre split movement, now continuing in rivalry to Redmond's paper, The National Volunteer. The prevailing mood of the movement was expressed by several of the members. I'll just read a bit from it. Um, Mr. Bowles. The young men of me would be better off fighting at the fields of France for the future of Ireland. That was his opinion, and he would remark that he was sorry to see there in the town of Navan, and probably in the village of Slane, where Mr. Ledwich came from, a few Sinn Feiners that followed the tail end of the Peace Party. There was nothing but strife in the country as long as these people had anything to do with the country. What was England's uprise would also be Ireland's uprise. Applause followed this speech. Mr. Ledwich, England's uprise has always been Ireland's downfall. Mr. Owens, what was he, Mr. Ledwich? Was he an Irishman or a pro German? Mr. Ledwich, I am an anti German and I am an Irishman. He was very angry as he left the meeting that day. To be publicly branded a coward was the last resort. He would cheerfully have sacrificed his life in the Irish volunteers. He had hoped to defend the Irish coast with his comrades. He would show them yet who was a coward. As he cycled home to Slane, these thoughts filled his mind, but also adding to his turmoil was his rejection and love by Elvon. Five days later, on the 24th of October, he enlisted in the Ryan Skilling Fusiliers, the same regiment as his patron, Lord Dunsany. Ledwich saw no contra contradiction in his actions. He felt that the best way to combat the Germans was at the front, not by passing resolutions at home. He believed that the war would be over quickly, and that when he returned, his military training would be invaluable to a revitalised volunteer movement. At the, the next meeting of the Navan Board of Guardians after his enlistment, they thanked him for taking such patriotic means of proving that he was not what they had all called him, a pro-German. One member said he was a real pa patriot, the guardian angel of Ireland's future, Another said his name should be written in gold in the national album and that the album should be placed in an honoured position in the Irish House of Parliament. After his enlistment, Frank was sent to Richmond Barracks here in Dublin for training and there he met Bob Christie from Belfast with whom he developed a strong friendship. In March 1915, he wrote to his friend Matthew McGoonan I'm just going to read the letter to you that he wrote to Matty. It gives you some idea of his letters as well as his poems, because his letters are just beautiful. It's Orderly Room, 5th in the Stilling Fusiliers, Richmond, Barrett, Dublin, and it's dated the 9th of March, 1915. My dear Matty, I flew in here on Pegasus. You might have known that he would bring me to some outlandish place, for strange are the ways of Pegasus. Uh, he brought me in here and then he left me. But I think he will come back for me when peace and furls are flag of truce. I may not be anywhere on the world when he calls again, if he does. If you do not hear from if you do not hear me singing after the war, you will know that I have gone across the pine to Keats and the rest of them. It was hard work here all the winter, preparing to meet the Kaiser's men. And now the spring is here, and all my blackbirds singing, and we were packing up for fields of the wall. We leave here about the 29th for France. But how are you this hundred years? I know trouble has lain against you, like an incubus and I feel for you many and many a time. I hope you're in good cheer again. I wish you could come
saw a cabinet meeting of Grattan's Parliament and discussed terms of peace with the warring powers. Or has it been abolished and the old members fled? Christ, Matthew, it's hard thinking of the old times. The pleasant Sundays we used to spend and the hopes we entertained. Their memories follow me so, like so many nemesis. And I often feel like a reprobate who has committed his last sin and dare not hope any more for absolution. I'm glad we're going to war. It will cheer me up. It will dispel these thoughts which are at war with me so long. Any got married. That was a great blow. Perhaps the greatest of all. I'm going to try for a day home Patrick's day. If I manage it, could you come to Spain? I want to see you so badly. How is your Pegasus? And how is the violin? Do you ever play sweet music now? Every time you play the blackbird, think on me. I love that tune and snatch of it sits singing my memory and odd times like ghosts haunting an old garden. My memory is no more than an old garden now, full of its withered flowers of a dead song. Drop me a line as soon as you can, telling me everything. I want to know all about everything and everything about all. Remember me to your brother and all your folk, your old affectionate friend in trouble. In April um, 1915, the division was sent to Basingstoke in the south of England for further training before being sent to the front. His first encounter with war was in Gallipoli in July 1915. We have some slides that are coming up. Um, writing to Lord Dunsany about the battle on the 15th of August, he wrote, It was hell. Hell, no man thought he would ever return. Just fancy out of D Company, 250 strong, only 76 returned. By heavens, you should know the bravery of these men. Ledwig survived Gallipoli and was pulled out in September, and his next theatre of war was in Serbia. When he was there, his first book of poems, Songs of the Fields, reached him. He was so delighted that the little volume was almost food and want to him. He wrote to Lord and Sane to thank him, but he said, My best is not in it. It received great reviews in London and went into a third edition very quickly. Shortly afterwards, he collapsed with an inflamed back and he was hospitalised near Salamanca and later transferred to Cairo. In April 1916, he was transferred to hospital in Manchester, and news reached him there of the insurrection in Dublin. Always a volunteer at heart, he was first delighted, as he believed in the old adage, England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. However, his excitement soon turned to grief when he heard of the executions. Macdonough, Connolly and Pierce had been his heroes. He had always been a champion of the workers' movement. He would have to get out of the army, he would have to get home to stay. He spent Easter week in hospital and then couldn't get home as the passenger boat service wasn't running. He stayed with his married sister Mary, who lived in Manchester, and he told his brother Joe later that he fretted at the delay as he wanted to spend all his short leave. On hearing of the execution of his good friend Thomas McDonough, he was detected and morose. He wrote to his good friend and fellow uh, soldier, Bob Christie, in Belfast. Yes, poor Ireland is always in trouble, though I am not a Sinn Feiner and you are a Carlsonite. Do our sympathies not go to Kathleen and Wilhelm? Poor McDonough and Pierce were two of my best friends and now 
there are dead. Madonna had a beautiful mind, don't you know his poetry? Sweeter than violin and loose is my love and she left me behind. I wish that all music were mute and I to all beauty were blind. 